a question or make a very brief comment. We only have a brief period of time. Everybody needs to get their rest tonight before we start the conference tomorrow morning. But if you'd like to make a brief comment or ask a question, there is an audience mic over here. So please go ahead and find your way to the audience mic if you'd like to ask a question or make a very brief comment. I'll just ask you guys, first of all, do you have a question for another person on the panel? <laughs> We're used to asking the questions, not yes. answering questions. Yeah. About yeah. <laughs> all right, we've got someone here. Great. Hi. Uh, thank you for, for all of this. So scientifically, we know that biodiversity is our greatest strength, but as a human species, Globally, in the United States, we are absolutely at a crisis for diversity. So how do we um, build inclusion globally within humanity? <laughs> well, wait, what specific? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Is it We're in a diversity crisis with, the, with, with humanity, people from different cultures, different backgrounds. It's not working. <laughs> and and it, it's our greatest strength, ultimately. I would say that in biology we recognize that diversity is also the component of complexity. So it's not a question for me of whether there's too much or too little diversity, but whether that diversity is integrated. And so how can we build ways for us to be diverse in mutually reinforcing ways? How do we do that? <laughs> if, I could, if I could add to this, well, maybe I could. <laughs> Okay, if I could add to it, how do we do it? We have to take away fear. And you take away fear, yes. And you take away fear by helping people experience their intrinsic connectedness. Yes. Yes. And we do that enough that it catches up. And, and it works. It works at a molecular level, but it's that collaborative community that we have to take to the macro level. Yeah, I think uh, another one is just, uh, the idea of transcending tribalism. So once you know, you know, and then you're responsible. So we have a higher consciousness, but we all still have within us an adaptive tribalism. And so it's our job to say, there I go being tribal, there I go saying they're different, there I go. The second thing is that in the human body, for example, and in all complex living systems, diversity is absolutely required. Like if you listen to a symphony, it would be super boring without diversity. So we've got to start teaching kids from a very early age to not just tolerate difference, but to celebrate difference. We We had a great model. Model, you can breathe with people that you don't normally breathe with. <laughs> eat with people that you don't normally eat with, and talk with people that you don't normally talk with. <laughs> okay, Danny. Uh, thanks very much for the panel. Um, I'm so curious. Historically, there's been a comment or uh, phrase, as, "As above, so below," and the process of inquiry is we look outside ourselves, but we also look inside ourselves, also. <clears throat> So as you all have looked into space, out there in this frontier where you have dust clouds and primary molecules and mystery, has that informed your personal practices? How do you engage my mentally, emotionally, physically practices that help access that core? Such as, for example, the Sufis will spin just like the planets. So uh, we're curious, I'm curious, everybody else is curious, what practices, do you have anything unique about your practice that help you view into space? I have a unique practice, which is that uh, I try to buy every young kid a telescope. And it could be a very small telescope. And uh, I've given away probably 100, 200 telescopes in my career, and uh, along with meteorites. You get one free with every crappie of them. Just kidding. Um, but all seriousness, when, when Galileo looked up with a tiny little telescope, 
He saw things that you can see with a telescope you can get for $20.99 on Amazon.com. I don't get any portion of the revenue. And what that did for him could be what it does for you or your children, even from the middle of Santa Clara, even from the middle of San Diego where I am, or New York City. See all the same craters on the moon that he saw, all the same rings of Saturn that he saw, all the same moons of Jupiter that he discovered for the first time. And there's no telling what that will do. It may do nothing. Uh, they may look at it and say, oh, there's a smudge. Very nice, Dad. You know, <laughs> Thanks for the telescope. But what if it doesn't? What if it really sparks curiosity that does help them develop a new perspective on what it means to be living on a planet on a rock of dust floating throughout the universe? So the idea is that the question, the practices of going to that deep mystery inquiry. Oh, how, how in practice do you do it? Oh, I was more explaining how I try to do it for other people. Uh, for me, yeah, so there are, you know, in, in practice, I try to witness all the astronomical phenomena that are accessible to me. Because every time I do that, every time I see a meteor shower, every time I see an eclipse, solar, lunar, anytime I look through a telescope, I get a taste of the excitement, awe, and wonder that I first experienced as a 12-year-old. And that takes me back, and that is a form of time travel, as short as I am. I will share with you the, um, the advice I was given when I was in graduate school from my Zen teacher's teacher. And he said, sit 20 minutes a day, it'll change your life. <laughs> sit as in sit meditation, Zazen meditation. And I said, I'm a scientist. I am going to put this one to the test. I have never known anyone for whom it's not true. But, it, it take, but the nervous system learns through repetition. We have to give it repeated practice. And if you don't have 20 minutes, you need 40 minutes, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I, I try to look for the um, birth of the first star each night. And it's harder than you think. Last summer, it took me three months to actually catch it just emerging. And, uh, but, it, but there's so much consciousness that comes in that time. You have to be very still, very focused, very attentive. And um, you have to be very present. Um, so give it a try. It takes the better part of the summer, though. So make sure you open and block your calendar. Lucas, what about you? You're like you're like one of those jokes, like a priest, an Episcopal priest, a martial artist, and an astrobiologist walking into a bar. Except it's like only you. <laughs> I enjoy, and I don't know that there's more to it than that. One of the great transformations for me was when I realized that analytical reasoning was for me a spiritual practice. And I learned that I could think while worship, while worshiping, and worship while thinking. And it led me to do both more critically, more joyously, and it led thinking to be a transformative process for me. It also gave me permission to think analytically in ways that didn't give me analytical conclusions. <laughs> and to say, this is a fun thing to do. <laughs> and the fact that it's fun to ask analytical, que analytical questions, even when you don't have the answer, that allows you to get so many more answers as well. get to this thing. <clears throat> so, um, when I think about space exploration, okay, background, I grew up on science fiction, and most of my friends really <coughs> want to go into space. Um, and would go with the drop of a hat. But, um, my concern within our present cultural um, worldview, universe view, is that we're not ready. That we can't talk to the aliens in our midst. We can't talk to people who are from other places besides ours, who are not like us, much less to our fellow animals and trees and other aspects towards the living earth. 
if we cannot interact with the aliens from the ocean who are casting themselves upon the shore, asking us to get the fucking plastic out of the water, and asking us for help and we don't understand. If we can't listen to the cries, then if we go into space, we will be following a manifest destiny. We will continue to commit genocide or species side, whatever you call it. We will become the locusts of the universe. What, how can we work to change our culture so that we're ready? Thank you. All right, guys, so can we be trusted to go into space? There's some cool science fiction short stories that talk about aliens doing a drive-by every couple hundred years and going like, yeah, no. <laughs> I think I'm going to give a, a good news, bad news answer, and that is your neighbor is going to be an alien until you talk to them. And as much as I want to be cautious and as much as I really encourage people who do extraterrestrial intelligence stuff to think about how communication will affect them before talking to them, not just how it will affect us. It's something we gotta practice, and it's hard. But go out there and talk to a tree, and see what happens, and a squirrel. Because we always have to expect them to respond in a novel way. And I think that really makes it easier to talk to those strange people who vote differently than we do. <laughs> so we always talk about how you know, is there life out there as advanced as we are? But what if we're the ones that are the most devolved? What if all these other stars and everything have advanced and it's all energetics and consciousness and they've got it right? And the we're the ones that are just kind of lagging behind. <laughs> We've got to think about why that is. And that should be motivation enough for us to start talking to each other. One thing to note is that we are all sitting in this room because a man took a trip to the moon, came back and had the gift of a beautiful, beautiful gift of samadhi, the first ever looking at our whole world from that distance, and came back and communicated it to us and sponsored 50 years of, of research into many questions. So. In some sense, Edgar's story is a, a story of really high value for humanity because we get that overview, we get that perspective of this precious little world that we must care for only really by going outside of it and looking back. Okay, last one. I'm grateful. <laughs> I have listen deeply and closely to what everyone has said this evening. And as a fellow educator, uh, I've been really concerned that the education process seems to be very much we're taught that we have to be exceptional. All the time, whether I'd be at Stanford or I'd be someplace, it'd always be about grades and that there was this minority who were the exceptional people. And it was always about Grady and about that. But I would imagine at NASA and in other things that you folks have done, it's become the team and the group. But my question is this, and in particular, uh, I'm finishing up my 48th book, and, and I love talking to people. That's why I, I do books. But the, and so I have a question for Yvonne, because to become an astronaut, and I've never met you, and, but I have a picture that you're one of the exceptional people. The exceptional people. So to become that exceptional and go through education, but now you're part of NASA and you're part of a team, whenever there's something that comes up inside that might go, hey, you know, we, we get so intense when it's so 
in our heart. We, we need to get our idea out and across to the team. How do you shift? How do you go from being the exceptional person who always had the greatest grades to being the incredible person who collaborates? And how do you make that shift? Uh, let's see. Wow. Thank you very much. That's, that's great. Uh, I must have missed the memo, but I will take your word for it. That's wonderful. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I'm really touched by that. Um, and, and that exceptionalism, if, if that's what you want to call it, is born of curiosity and the um, desire, being compelled to want to connect and to gain that consciousness and that deeper understanding. And that's something that's universal. So when I look within myself, I don't see the exception. I see the rule. And I love engaging and connecting in these kinds of conversations because I can see the reflection of how each and every one of us are all exceptional. So the only piece of advice I can um, give to you to make sure that um, fear-based fear decisions don't drive a partition between us and that we know that we are all together on this spaceship traveling through the universe and the multiverse is that if if I'm the, 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 the gold standard, if I am the example of, of what you can do, in other words, if I can do it, then there truly is space for all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Alex, are you here? Yeah. There he is. Okay. All right. Well, I really appreciate each and every one of you panelists for coming today and this evening and spending your time with us to stretch our minds and stretch our hearts as we move into the rest of our conference. Thank you all for coming and being willing to listen and to play along and to explore and be curious. I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you in the morning and before you do anything. Alex, our MC for the conference, is coming up with some final announcements. Make sure that you spend some time with the speakers outside. Jenny Whitelaw has a book. I hear that somebody's giving me meteorites. There's another book out there. 